Hi, this is Dave Chapman, also known as Professor Telescope. I'm a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Halifax Centre. This talk, Telescope Tales, is about the 11 telescopes I've owned over six decades of observing. I came up with the idea of giving this talk when I went to the Nova East Star Party here in Nova Scotia and I brought along several of my small telescopes which you can see set up here in front of my campsite. People would come by and I would tell them about the telescopes and what I had observed with them and where I had taken them and I realized that each telescope has a story and the collection of those stories would make a nice presentation. So I put the presentation together and I've given it twice now. I got my first telescope on my 10th birthday in July 1963. Um, it was uh, a surprise to me. My parents bought me this telescope, although I think I'd been very interested in astronomy for quite some time and I had been bringing home from school uh, copies of Sky and Telescope that were loaned to me by a, a kind teacher uh, who saw that I was interested in astronomy and I, I must have been poring over these advertisements in the um, magazine and uh, making remarks about telescopes. So in any case on my 10th birthday this telescope showed up along with a book by Patrick Moore called The Amateur Astronomer which I still have. Um, it, I only just realized recently that this telescope was not meant for astronomy. It, it's really more of a spotting scope or a terrestrial telescope. It has an erect image and uh, it doesn't have a finder scope. It doesn't have a diagonal for looking, uh, making, uh, it doesn't have a diagonal for making it easy to look high in the sky. But it did have a nice solid wood tripod It was and a, and a good yoke mount. It was a very stable and uh, um, useful telescope for me. I did a lot of observing with this telescope. The, the moon, the planets, um, you know, I remember seeing Jupiter and its uh, satellites, double stars, uh, the brighter nebula. I had a lot of fun with this telescope. I'd like to say more about this telescope. Notice that it doesn't have a finder, but it didn't really need one because the very lowest power of the telescope was 15 times. The optical system was unique in that not only did it provide an erect image to the viewer, there was a kind of a Barlow lens uh, included uh, inside with a click uh, stop as you pulled the tube out it would go between 15 power 30 power 45 power and 60 power so it had this variable power um, this is quite unusual I've never seen it on any other telescope the other thing is that I had I have good memories of using this telescope even though it wasn't perfect for astronomy um, I saw great views of the moon, uh, Jupiter and it, its moons, Saturn, the brighter nebula and so on. Later on in my astronomical hobby, I could not understand why people were so disparaging about TASCO telescopes because I have great memories of using that telescope when I was 10 years old. Uh, at the end of this talk, I might be able to resolve that question. Now here's a picture from that time. I don't believe that is uh, my telescope there, although my telescope was very similar to that. Um, in this group of uh, young observers, I'm the third one from the right, and behind me, second from the right, is the well-known Sky News columnist Ken Hewitt White, who is a kind of a mentor and a bit of a leader in our group. Uh, the person on the right is John Conville, my good friend, sadly no longer with us. On the other side of the telescope from me, uh, the fellow at the far left, I cannot recall his name, 
the next person over with the, the big grin on his face is Chris Martin. And he's a RASC Saskatoon member, and I believe uh, he lives out there and he, he drives a school bus or, or something like that. I'm going to skip over my second telescope. I don't have a picture. It was a telescope I made from a kit. It was a four and a quarter inch reflector. I put it together, it seemed to work okay, but I wasn't very handy and I never mounted it. I never had a mount for it. And uh, so I ended up just selling it to somebody who could uh, do something with it. After that, my interest in astronomy took a bit of a hiatus through the 70s and uh, I didn't do a whole lot. I was going to university. I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in physics. I ended up getting a job in Halifax and I moved out to Halifax. And um, my interest in astronomy was uh, kick-started again. My roommate was an RASC member and uh, I recalled all the fun I had with astronomy. So I started observing. I didn't own a telescope, just binoculars. So I bought this C90 Maksutov design. Um, at the time, uh, it it came as an astro telescope or a uh, spotting scope or a telephoto lens. And I got the astro version with the equatorial mount. Um, it had uh, it had 0.96 inch eyepieces, but they were good quality Kellners. And I bought some orthoscopic eyepieces. Had an odd kind of Barlow lens, which fit into the tube before you added the um, the diagonal. It had slow motions. Uh, it was a nice, solid, solidly built telescope. I observed much of the Messier catalog with this telescope, although I did use a friend's uh, daub for some of the fainter objects. The interesting story about this telescope is that I took it down to the Caribbean with me to observe Halley's, Halley's Comet, and, uh, and that went well. Uh, on the way back, however, in Canada, the customs people took uh, an intense interest in it and uh, wanted to take it apart to see inside. I managed to uh, thwart that. Um, I said, look, you know, at the end of this, there's a little window. You, you can look in and see that, the, you know, it's a telescope. Of course, that's the meniscus of the, the, um, the corrector plate that, at, the, at the front of the telescope. And uh, anyway, they, they bought that explanation and the telescope survived. Um, I refurbished this recently. Uh, I took it apart and was able to, uh, well, it didn't really need much cleaning, but I cleaned it up a little and I, I blackened some of the reflective shiny surfaces inside and added some um, flocking paper to the tube. And that cut down a lot of the stray light that was scattered and improved the contrasts. So I don't use it a lot, but uh, I'm happy to have this telescope. In the mid 90s, it seemed like refractors were making a big comeback. And uh, I got very interested in the Teleview telescopes. Uh, they were a bit on the expensive side, but in uh, 97, I decided to buy this uh, Teleview Ranger, it's no longer made. It's a 70 millimeter f6.8 achromatic lens. Uh, it was the first telescope I uh, owned that I used 1.25 inch eyepieces. It had a helical focuser. Um, I came with a 20 millimeter Teleview Plossel. I bought a used 7 millimeter. I also had a Barlow and uh, then a two and a half times. Teleview PowerMate. Uh, this is a nice little grab-and-go telescope. It's been a lot of different places. Um, uh, it broke in uh, 2019. It turned out there was a screw that just gave way. The, the screw provided three functions. <laughs> uh, and I was able to contact uh, Teleview by phone and even though the telescope was no longer in production, they had spare parts and they were nice enough to send me um, the part I needed, the this, this special screw. Uh, they didn't charge me for that, but they charged me about $10 for shipping. And I thought that was a pretty good deal. So I'm very happy 
to have that telescope restored and uh, back in the uh, the arsenal. This Ranger telescope has served me very well. Um, in 2004, I took it to Nova East and I was observing with it there. And it was at the Nova East in August 2004 that I noticed the Lunar X in that telescope and uh, something that I hadn't seen before and a lot of people were unaware of. Uh, I'm not going to say that I discovered it because I was there all along and I th I'm pretty sure other people had seen it, but it, there didn't seem to be any record of it. Anyhow, after I uh, noticed it and started talking about it and, uh, um, you know, published a picture of it uh, taken by Tony Jones and described it, it kind of caught people's fancy and it's become very well known. Uh, and so I've, I get credit for popularizing the Lunar X. Um, that telescope, uh, one of its first trips was to go to the Curacao solar eclipse in 1998. There it is there. Uh, where is my, me and my wife and daughter uh, looking at the eclipse. Um, it also went out to Winnipeg in 2012 to see the transit of Venus because uh, it was going to be cloudy in Halifax and I wanted to see the transit of Venus. It was my last chance and I went. And uh, the views through that telescope were um, every bit as good, if not better, than the views through bigger telescopes. Um, it's so portable, uh, I can take it canoe camping, and it's been to Kejimkujik National Park a couple of times. And uh, here's me uh, ob doing a daylight observation uh, of the moon. And I uh, I got out there, and then I realized that Aldebaran, the bright star Aldebaran, was going to get occulted by the moon in broad daylight. And I was able to find the moon and watch that occultation. That was very, you know, that was a lot of fun. So uh, a great little telescope. I don't think I'll ever part with it. So here's my fifth telescope. Uh, I bought it used from a member of the sender who was moving, I believe, and wanted to uh, uh, divest himself of it. Um, I trusted the fellow, so pretty much bought it untested for a good price used. It was a good 8-inch uh, F6 Dobsonian, and it gave me a little, a little more aperture for observing. Um, I don't know what motivated me exactly. I think it was just the opportunity. It seemed like a good price for a decent telescope. And uh, uh, anyway, I had a really good view of the um, close opposition of Mars that year. I uh, saw several comets, observed several comets visually. And um, most of all, uh, I used this telescope in 2009-2010 uh, to um, go through the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program, which is quite a challenging lunar observing program, but this telescope was perfect for it. I kept it in the, the shed. Um, as you can see there in the bottom picture, there I am observing in wintertime. Uh, that picture was taken by moonlight. <laughs> So uh, I kept that telescope in the shed. I pretty much used the same eyepiece uh, all the time, gave me around 200 power. And uh, I worked diligently through that observing program and uh, was able to see all of the required objects plus many of the, the challenge objects. So that telescope uh, served me very well and enjoyed it quite a bit. My sixth telescope was a 100 millimeter Skywatcher refractor. Again, uh, this came into my hands because a fellow member was selling and it was a good opportunity, good price. And, you know, I always had a soft spot for refractor telescopes, so I bought it. I already had that equatorial mount. Um, that I bought used. It's a it's a great Polaris mount and uh, that telescope worked on it uh, 
perfectly. Um, I haven't used this a lot for observing. Um, I don't know why. Um, I guess I had the other telescope for deep sky stuff. This telescope was really good for planetary and uh, double stars and and ended up being the telescope that I like to take to outreach events uh, for public observing. It it um, it has a classic look to it and it was easy to transport and set up. It had a um, I think I used it because it had the tracking mount. Once you set it up and had a an object in the field of view, it would uh, keep tracking. So it was great for public observing. It was the um, really the only uh, mount and telescope I had that was was good for that. Um, I bought a um, an erecting prism for that. So when people looked at the moon, say, it would look the same as it did uh, in the sky, only only magnified. And uh, I still have that telescope and the prism. Uh, I almost forgot about this one. The Galileo scope is included here. Uh, it's an unnumbered telescope. I, I do own one, or actually more than one, but I, I don't use them for observing personally. Uh, I use them for outreach and teaching people about how telescopes work. Uh, I've done a number of workshops with Galileo scopes. Uh, in 2009 they came out as part of the International Year of Astronomy. The kits were quite inexpensive and uh, our center bought uh, several um, boxes, uh, several kits of uh, including these telescopes and I personally bought 10 because the price was so good. So um, one of the uh, things I've done with those telescopes is in 2010 I went down to Cuba um, and I did some outreach down there and I brought uh, 12 of these telescopes with me that were donated by St. Mary's University Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics and um, I was able to uh, get those into the hands of the Cuban amateurs and uh, um, I've, I've done a couple of workshops down there where I assemble uh, the telescopes or, or actually the children assemble the telescopes and, and learn how to use them. One of the workshops was done uh, at the um, Museum of Natural History in Havana and where we put one telescope together and uh, the children used it to look through the window at the bookstalls across the street and uh, uh, on the, the bottom left there um, we did a workshop in Santa Clara, which is uh, another large city in, in Cuba. And uh, I was supposed to go to a school, um, but uh, the authorities wouldn't let me in the school because I only had a tourist visa. And to do what I was doing, uh, they said I needed to have a different kind of visa. So it almost seemed like it was a waste of time until one of the teachers suggested that she could bring the students out of the school and we could do the program in the park across the street. And so that's what we're doing. We, we did a whole program out in the open air where we put together one of the telescopes. And, um, and after we were done with that class, uh, another teacher and a class came out and we did it all over again. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, there are 12 of those telescopes uh, in various parts of Cuba right now being used for educational purposes. One of the things I noticed about the 8-inch daub when I was observing at high power was um, that the floaters in my eye became a real problem. It, uh, it limited the magnification I could get out of the 8-inch. It, it just wasn't a pleasant experience. And after reading Roy Bishop's uh, handbook article about uh, aperture of telescopes and exit pupil and magnification, I realized that what I needed to do was go to a larger aperture, not so much for the light gathering power, but just so that I could have a larger exit pupil at a given magnification and not be bothered by the floaters. So I went from, I decided uh, I would go from an 8 inch to a 12 inch telescope. And um, I decided to go whole hog and and purchase a go-to telescope. Um, I guess I'd felt by this time 
that uh, I had earned my um, earned the right to have a go-to telescope. I'd, I'd proven it myself with a push to and done the Messier list and the, the lunar observing list, and it was time to treat myself. My reasoning was that uh, I only had limited amount of time under the dark sky, and uh, I'd rather spend it looking at things than trying to find them. So I sold Telescope 5, the 8-inch daub, to help raise money to buy the 12-inch. And I've had that telescope since 2012, and uh, I, um, I'm very pleased with it. Um, it gives me a lot of pleasure. One of the advantages of owning a Skywatcher SynScan go-to telescope is that uh, because I'm so familiar with its operation, um, I'm also familiar with the operation of the uh, 400 millimeter telescope, that uh, 16, 16 inch aperture at the uh, St. Croix Observatory that Halifax Center runs, and also the 250 millimeter, the 10 inch version that Kejim Kujik Dark Sky Preserve um, has. So all of these telescopes use the same principles and uh, software, and I'm quite familiar with, with those, and I'm comfortable about, uh, around all three telescopes. So that's a, that's a good thing to have. Here's another unnumbered uh, telescope, uh, because it, it, it never belonged to me. Um, it was brought to me by a good friend. Uh, she uh, dug it out of the attic and said that this was a telescope her father had used and maybe she had used it a little and uh, she was hoping that her son might get some enjoyment out of it so but she, but it was in pretty sad shape she brought it to me and uh, I was able to um, clean it up and fix it up and um, it you know it, it wasn't too tough to work on it was an interesting little telescope uh, from the 60s um, one of the things that's interesting about this telescope is that the uh, it seems like the whole thing was shipped inside the telescope tube. In other words, the telescope tube is the shipping tube with everything packed inside. And then once you unpacked it, you assembled the telescope and um, and uh, and used it that way. Uh, the reason I know that or suspect that is that on the telescope tube, there's a, a sticker, which is a shipping sticker from Canadian Pacific and it's got the address of the uh, recipient on it uh, so it was pretty obvious that it was a shipping sticker. I was able to get those mirrors re-illuminized. Uh, there's a bit of a story behind that I won't go into but I was able to get them re-illuminized for, for basically the shipping cost and I was able to get a pretty nice picture out of it, uh, a view out of it and I was able to uh, capture a photograph by holding my iPhone to the uh, eyepiece and uh, took the picture of the moon there. It gives pretty nice views. Um, I returned it to the owner and I had the pleasure of seeing three generations of the same family uh, using the telescope to look at the moon. The, the, the grandmother, the mother, and the, uh, the son. Uh, so that... Um, that uh, did my heart good to see that telescope back in use after so many years. Now here's an interesting telescope. It's again, it's a, a Skywatcher telescope. They call it a mini daub, but it's not really a Dobson mount. But it does have a very interesting tracking mount, which is called the Virtuoso. Um, I don't know if they sell these anymore. Uh, I have seen same mount with uh, a Maksutov telescope, but I have not seen recently the, uh, the, um, the mount with the, the Newtonian reflector. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with this telescope. I, I won it at a door prize at the 2015 General Assembly. And um, anyway, it, it's become a kind of a favorite telescope for a couple of reasons. It's pretty compact. And uh, if you sit it on a tripod, um, it's a tabletop telescope, but it's got a tripod socket. So I got a pair of legs for it, or a set of legs. 
and uh, you can observe sort of at uh, eye height and uh, you move it around and the, the, the height of the eyepiece doesn't change too much. Um, another feature of this telescope is that although it doesn't come with a hand controller, if you already own a SynScan hand controller, it plugs into this mount and you can use it the same uh, as the other SynScan telescopes. Since I already owned one and knew how to use the controller, uh, it was very easy for me to add that to the telescope. Um, I took that to Costa Rica in 2017 and used that to observe uh, the southern sky. And uh, I, using the GoTo um, facility, I was able to capture quite a few um, objects in the, the five nights that I had there. I was uh, quite pleased to have that telescope in Costa Rica. The telescope uh, came with a, a solar filter, a uh, full aperture solar filter, and it's quite a nice telescope for looking at the sun in white light. Uh, it's a very, very nice view, and uh, I used the telescope in 2016 to observe the transit of Mercury. Um, there's a way to align those telescopes uh, um, without using stars at least to align them well enough that it will track the sun and uh, I was able to do that on the day of the transit and keep keep uh, the sun and mercury in the field of view for passers-by who came to look at the transit. Here we are uh, in uh, 2019 November the 11th. Uh, I'm here again observing a transit of mercury from my home just in front of the house there and I invited friends and neighbors to come by to have a look at it so I've observed two transit of Mercury with this uh, SynScan Virtuoso uh, Newtonian telescope. Uh, I quite like it and uh, I'll probably continue to use it. My ninth telescope uh, I bought from a friend and fellow RASC member who was downsizing and uh, he was offering his Coronado 40 millimeter um, solar scope uh, for a really good price compared to a new one and again it was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up so I purchased it. Um, I haven't used it a lot. Um, to be honest I find them a little fiddly to work with and uh, I might sell this one, I don't know. Uh, um, it, I'd have to compare it with, with another one to see if it's actually working correctly, but uh, I find it a bit fiddly, but uh, for the time being I've, I'm owning it. The, the problem of course is that we're in the middle of a pretty deep solar minimum right now, so there's not much going on uh, on the surface of the Sun. This telescope did make it to the uh, 2017 eclipse of the Sun. Uh, here's a picture of um, the telescope in, um, in Nebraska. I didn't take it with me. I flew down, but my friend uh, took his truck and camper and uh, he asked to borrow the scope and I gave it to him and he set it up on his uh, little cube mount there and uh, we were able to view the, the Sun uh, uh, before and after the eclipse. Um, that little mascot there is Garcia. He's he's a, a little um, beanie baby stuffed bear who travels with me uh, a lot of places around the world and gets involved in quite a few of my adventures. Okay, telescope number 10. Uh, there's quite a bit to say about this telescope. Not much of it good. Uh, I bought this on sale at a, um, a department store, and uh, when it was uh, it was on sale, and again it was an opportunity. I thought I'd pick it up, but it sat around for quite a long while in my basement before I ever did anything with it. I finally pulled it out in 2019, and I said, "Okay, let's let's have a look and let's treat it on the moon." And uh, oh my goodness, I looked at the moon, and it was terrible. Oh, it was the most awful view I'd seen through a telescope and so I set to work on it. Uh, the first thing that 
I found was that the secondary mirror had not been installed properly. It wasn't so much that it wasn't collimated, but it was an elliptical mirror and it had been installed uh, cockeyed at a funny angle. And even if you could uh, adjust, the ang adjust the tilt of the mirror, it still gave horrible views. Uh, so I had to take that off and put it back on again. And even then it didn't, do, uh, didn't give very good views at all. The problem with this telescope is that it's a, a 76 millimeter telescope. It, it's an F4. Um, mirror, uh, which is insane, as I say here. Um, you, it's a spherical F4 mirror. Now you can get away with a spherical mirror if it's F9 or F10, but at F4 you definitely need that mirror to have a parabolic surface in order to focus things um, from all parts of the mirror at the same point. And uh, uh, so if you don't have a parabolic mirror, you get something called spherical aberration. And the spherical aberration on this telescope is ridiculous. Um, so even when you get it kind of working, uh, you don't get a very good view. There, There's a picture of the view of the moon uh, taken with my iPhone through the eyepiece. Um, um, and uh, well, you can, if you compare it to the picture through the uh, 1969 Edmund telescope, this picture is very blurry, even though the aperture is the same. Uh, the finder they sell with it is, is completely useless. Plastic lenses, and they, they call it a 24 millimeter aperture. And then right behind the um, objective lens of the finder, there's an aperture stop, which <laughs> it really is... I mean, it's almost lying to, to call that a 24 millimeter aperture. Uh, I don't have anything good to say about this telescope. The best I can say is that it's uh, better than nothing, I guess. But that's not saying very much. So let's end this uh, presentation on an up note. The 11th telescope I only just recently acquired this. Uh, when I was putting together the presentation, uh, I was very curious about my original point about TASCO telescopes and whether they had any quality or not. And uh, I was poking around and uh, on a um, online used sort of marketplace I saw this advertisement for a vintage uh, telescope and um, I had a look at it and it looked turned out to be a TASCO 12TE from around 1965. I don't have a precise date for it. I did some research on the telescope and I found a parts list from that time. I went to see the person who owned it. Now this telescope had been owned by her father and used and he had passed on and they were looking to um, give this telescope a new home. So I looked at the parts in the, it came in a nice box, nice wooden box, and I determined that every single original piece of, uh, of the telescope was there in the box. All of the bits and pieces, the, the eyepieces, the, all the screws and washers and wing nuts, everything was in there, even the useless um, solar filter that screws into the eyepiece, which we don't recommend anymore, but it was all there. And I gave the woman, I offered the woman a little bit less money than she was asking for, because there was still a risk, from my point of view, whether the lens was any good. Uh, and she accepted my offer. She knew that it was going to a good home that I had, and I appreciated these things. I took it home and cleaned it up and uh, it turned out that the uh, objective lens was excellent and I was able to, um, uh, I trained this telescope on the moon, got a really good view of the moon. I took a photograph with my iPhone through the eyepiece. I don't haven't included it here but it was a really good picture and I sent it to the person that I bought it from and she was very pleased to see that, you know, the telescope had performed as well as it did and that I was getting some enjoyment out of it. 
Now this telescope is similar to the one I had when I was 10 years old, but it's got a finder scope, it has a star diagonal, it has slow motions and altitude and azimuth, it's got the wooden tripod. When everything's all nicely tightened up and snug, it's a very solid telescope with uh, nice motions, doesn't jiggle at all. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with this telescope, but I was very pleased to find out that the TASCO telescopes that were made in the mid 60s were in fact decent telescopes and that my memory of my own telescope is, is a, a faithful one. They used to make good telescopes. Uh, I don't know what happened uh, after that. They must have been bought out and now they tend to make crappy telescopes. But I don't own any of those. When I give this presentation to a live audience, this is the point at which I stop and invite questions from the audience, comments, and provide answers. We have a little discussion. Obviously that can't happen with a recorded presentation, but uh, when I post this on my YouTube channel and in other social media sites or email chat groups, there sh would be an opportunity for people to write to me and ask me questions. So uh, if you have any questions or comments on my presentation, I would love to hear from you. I'm very responsive. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, we'll uh, hopefully do more presentations in the future.